Amen. We're going to uh, read a few verses tonight from the first chapter of Philippians. And uh, I probably do need to warn you that um, following our normal uh, approach to the scriptures here, we probably won't get into this first chapter tonight. But we want to read it just so that as we build up our thoughts over the next number of weeks, we will uh, be able to identify uh, this word with the word that God breathes into our hearts and lives. What we will be doing is uh, just by way of um, the confirmation of the background or uh, a way of understanding the context, we will be going into the 16th chapter of um, the book of Acts. So we, we will just take a, a few moments just to connect with uh, the formation of the church in Philippi. And uh, that will give us a, a good concept of how uh, Paul then addresses the needs as he writes to that particular church. So we begin, Paul and Timothy, born servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always and in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you were all partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And we'll end our reading there at verse 11. And we know that once again the Lord will confirm uh, his word in our hearts and um, through it produce the fruit of righteousness. Uh, if you are looking for a little title for our study tonight, uh, it simply is, Amid the Scorn, a Church is Born. And uh, you'll see how we identify that as we go through the little study. One of the uh, key features of uh, the joyous expressions that we often read of the Apostle Paul are found when he meditates or reminisces upon the memories of particular visits that he has had in his ministry to various churches. He, he will often refer to not only the events that took place, uh, the experiences that they enjoyed, but he will also reference people 
and sometimes he will single out people in order to indicate that he was really encouraged and blessed uh, either by their support uh, or through their prayers. And, and that becomes a, a kind of feature of most of the um, letters of Paul. And it's interesting that even when writing to the most difficult of congregations, and I'm thinking Corinth at this stage, uh, he will still find some way of elevating what he perceives to be the good graces of uh, the believers there. And he will encourage them and uh, he will uh, challenge them uh, in those specific areas. Now, the background to what we are going to be studying over the next number of um, months, uh, years, uh, as the Lord leads and directs us, the background is uh, that we have here a typical response to the challenge of conceiving and then committing to the call of God or the revelation of the will of God. Uh, in the 16th chapter of Acts, and we'll go over to the, this in a moment, it was a vision of the night. It was a, a dream where God appeared to, uh, to Paul. And in this dream, he received what we identify as the Macedonian call. Come over into Macedonia and help us. And uh, the help, of course, was uh, featuring the gospel. It was a challenge to take the gospel in among the Gentiles at a time where uh, there was a vulnerability to the preaching. That is, there was a, a, a movement against what was seen to be a push coming out from Jerusalem uh, in what we now identify as the early church, where many um, Jews were being converted and Gentiles are now beginning to hear the gospel and to be... Uh, at least to a degree, assimilated into the church. And at the head of this movement, we have had Peter, for example, who has been one of the key leaders of this, um, this push towards the religion that became known as the way. Um, that centered around mainly Jerusalem and, and uh, Judea and so on. But, but now the gospel is, is being taken to the uttermost parts of the earth. And that was the absolute fulfillment of that commission. You shall receive power, Acts 1 verse 8, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem in Judea and Samaria, and on to the furthermost parts of the earth. And um, that, of course, was now taking place um, partly by the intrusions of the early apostles out into these regions round about. And, uh, of course, then when persecution came, everyone started to scatter, and it was soon known that the gospel was reaching into the furthermost parts of, uh, of the earth. But here in this second movement, if you like, this evangelical thrust, uh, Macedonia is now about to open up to the gospel. Uh, and uh, were we to, to get a, a, a concept of just how fertile and how rich uh, an area this, this became uh, under the ministry of the Word of God. You'll remember that when Paul was wanting an illustration to encourage all of the churches to rally around and give financial support 
to a struggling cause in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem were struggling because the most intense opposition to the word was there. And uh, the churches were under immense pressure. And so Paul organized a, a, a push, a, a support mechanism for churches all throughout the regions had special collections and then eventually these were brought to help the church in Jerusalem. And when Paul was wanting to illustrate the generosity that was required amongst God's people, it was in fact the churches in Macedonia that uh, he raises up as the standard. Uh, and uh, that, in a sense, uh, illustrates just how this church in Philippi grew in stature and uh, in grace from what were very, very humble beginnings. Uh, the formation of the church in Philippi marks, uh, and this becomes a very key feature, it marks the entrance of the gospel for the very first time into Europe. So that, that's a key uh, mark uh, in the, the messages and ministry of Paul. Let's just go in our Bibles over to Acts chapter 16. And uh, we'll, we'll read that call, and it comes up in um, verse 9 and verse 10. And this, of course, sets the scene. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now we could spend a considerable amount of time, no doubt, in those two verses, looking at the call and how God presented that in a very practical way to Paul. And we could then look in verse 10 at the response to the call. There's no discussing, no debating, no deliberating upon it. It is a call that has an immediate acceptance. And the reason for that, you will note, is in the last part of verse 10, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now this, dare I suggest, ought to be the conviction in the call of anyone who has that task of preaching the gospel. Sadly, we have lost that conviction and there are many today who go in to our pulpits and they become ministers because it appears to be a suitable career choice. Uh, mind you, that uh, opinion is, is very quickly changing now. And it's very difficult to get young men to come through into the ministry. But there are all kinds of reasons for that. But, but here... It is uh, to a degree, and in a slightly different way, the same kind of reaction and response to Abraham in the Old Testament. Remember when God told him to take Isaac out and uh, offer Isaac up as a sacrifice. The, the scriptures tell us and they confirm that uh, very early in the morning, Abraham got up and he went off uh, in commitment to that challenge and call of God. Uh, sometimes we feel, we, we sense, but we're not sure of how God is leading us or what God is calling us to be or to do. And we engage in all manner 
of uh, deliberations, trying to work out the best options. And, and there's always a danger that we put that physical and emotional uh, into the mix that, that clouds that clear and certain call of God. We need to be aware that God still calls us through his word and by the inner assurances and conviction of his Holy Spirit. So we look at um, verse 12 of uh, Acts 16, and we find out a little more about uh, Philippi. Philippi being the, um, the Jericho of the Promised Land. Remember when God led Israel across the River Jordan in their first incursion into the land of Canaan. The first city they had to conquer was Jericho. It was a walled city. And uh, God, remember, opened it up in a very unique and specific way where they simply walked around the walls and eventually, having followed all the instructions, the walls crumbled and fell and uh, became exposed. That's a kind of similar picture to what's happening here in uh, Macedonia. Philippi is the first port of call, the first place where they come uh, and which they are to eventually conquer, though it will be a difficult task. But look at verse 12. And from there to Philippi, so they've made the journey, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia. And then note that little comment, a colony. Uh, we, we will be just linking this in uh, shortly. But here we have the Roman Empire. And Philippi was a strategic city in the Roman Empire. Now, that's going to figure um, as we go through the book of, uh, of Philippians. Now, you could all be uh, directed to a study of secular history if you want to know more about Philippi, and it will be a good exercise just to, to follow that uh, through, um, as it would add some color and, uh, and interest to um, uh, an understanding of the cultural background uh, into which the apostles uh, came. Philippi was located to the southeast, and uh, verse 11 uh, will tell us there that Neapolis um, was its seaport. It was named after its king, Philip II, who captured it around about 300 BC. Now, I'm not going to go into all the history, but just the parts that are not only interesting but important. He, of course, uh, was the king who had a very well-known son, who thought that he was great. His name was Alexander. So you've all heard about Alexander the Great. Um, the, uh, the empire, or that is the Roman Empire, uh, expanded under Alexander. And then, of course, after Alexander was uh, killed, uh, his four generals broke the uh, area up and, and they kept on conquering uh, as the Roman Empire spread across. And you will see, if you go through your history books, that that goes right from uh, northern Greece right through all the way to uh, parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, that is also important to keep in mind because when we get into the book of Daniel, and when we're looking through our studies in Thessalonians, 
we will be reading about the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, the beast. And uh, this will be the area from which he will appear. It will be from uh, the revived or revised Roman Empire. Now, if you go back into chapter 2 and 3 of Daniel's prophetic book, you will see there the image of Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, all of this history uh, that is, uh, on, has unfolded, uh, that included Macedonia and so on, is all set out uh, very clearly in those two chapters in, uh, in particular. Right down to the kingdom of uh, Alexander the Great and then his demise and then the four generals that came uh, and took over in his, uh, in his place. But the, the point of all of this uh, is simply to, to outline the fact that Philippi was one of those cities uh, from which the armies of Alexander the Great were, uh, were sourced. They, many of the men in from, from Philippi became soldiers in the armies of uh, Alexander the, uh, the, the Great. And a little bit more of the significant history is that it became a, a what's referred to in verse 12 there as a colony. Uh, that, that gives it a, a position among the hierarchy. It's, a, it, it's a, an elite uh, city. Uh, it became a colony as a result of the battle that took place in 42 BC in which the armies of Mark Antony and Octavian <coughs> defeated those of Brutus and Cassius, the assassins of Julius Caesar. So there's a lot of history that's built into this very cosmopolitan um, city of Philippi. Many of the returned servicemen, or we would call them war veterans, uh, came back to retire in uh, Philippi. Um, the other thing, and I'll just toss this in very quickly, is that not only uh, did Philippi become a hub of, of history, but it was also a, 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 a very unique kind of place uh, geologically. It stood between Rome and Greece in the west and Asia Minor uh, to the east. And uh, it straddled the great military trade route that uh, ran between the Adriatic and the Aegean seas. So it wasn't only strong militarily, but it was strong commercially. So it was a very, very much a, um, a, a, a hub um, and a, a vital one at that. Monuments to the imperial cult, that is uh, Caesar. Remember Caesar, who set himself up not only as a king, but as a god and required not only requested, but required that he be worshipped as a god. And um, as a result, everywhere the Romans went, they built these monuments and statues and idols and images, and, and all were designed to elevate the authority uh, and, in the eyes of the people, the deity of uh, Caesar. Isis was regarded as the protector of Philippi, and that was introduced around 42 BC. So there was a real mix of, uh, of uh, dwellers in, in Philippi, and in that mix were all of these religious representations as well as cultural uh, identities. 
So it was into this uh, culture and, and religious mix that Paul is now to come with the liberating gospel. So look at chapter 2 with me and uh, verse 15. And here is Paul's take on, uh, on Philippi. That you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault. Note, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So there's the contrast. You have the believers that Paul is writing to in the church, and you have the non-believers. And the non-believers are opposing the truth of the gospel, and that is spilling over into persecution. So Paul is identifying, on the one hand, believers who have become blameless and harmless. Now, that in itself is quite an astonishing uh, comment, given that he contrasts them with a crooked and perverse generation. So out of the crooked and perverse generation, God has raised up those who are, uh, in Paul's words, uh, blameless, in verse 15, and harmless. Children of God without fault. Now, we know uh, immediately that it's no small task to live an upright, godly life when you are surrounded by the filth of the world. And yet that is the challenge that Paul presents to them as he does also to, uh, to us. So Paul uh, comes into Philippi, and we did notice this on last Sunday morning, that one of the first things that Paul did wherever he would go, he would find a good location from which to share the gospel. If it was the marketplace and most people were there, that's where Paul would be found. But very often, he would go to the synagogue. And we know that Paul was uniquely blessed in that he had connections in all of these particular and important aspects of, of life. Being a Jew, he was entitled to go to the synagogue because he had been through the school of Gamaliel. There were two known uh, schools, uh, religious schools, and Gamaliel was known to be the best, the top school. And Paul had gone right through that school, so he was entitled he was authorized, he was credentialed, he'd even worked for the Sanhedrin before he was uh, born again. So he had the ability to go into the synagogue and to explain the law to them. And uh, he would do that if that was at all possible. Uh, and that way he would make a connection not only with the common people but also with the religious dignitaries as well. So he, he was covering every base. But there's one problem when he comes into Macedonia. When he arrives in Philippi, there is no synagogue because he's left the world of uh, the, the Jewish traditions and he is now launching into not only a new area, a new part of the then known world, but he's also now coming in amongst unfamiliar people with an unfamiliar culture. And the very means that he has been able to use to project himself into the community does not exist. He does not find a ready audience or or group of contacts. 
He has to begin from scratch. Now, the second interesting uh, thought, and uh, it, it becomes very vital to what begins as the movement uh, to build or, or, or to form this early church, is that when he begins to move around and look around, to find a group in which he can introduce the gospel. What does he find? A group of women. Now, that's a strange thing for Paul. You don't read of church foundation members in uh, the early part of the book of Acts coming from amongst the female population. But the very first convert that we read about in Philippi is Lydia. And Lydia is not a Jew. She is a proselyte. In fact, she has an Asian background. And uh, you uh, you want to know where that uh, came from? Look at verse 13 of uh, Acts chapter 16. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now, what does that suggest? The women who met there. Well, it tells us two things. One is, this was the place for prayer. These women met there. So the thought is that even before Paul came, these women were getting together by the riverside and they were having a prayer meeting. Now, we're not told who they were praying to, what they were praying about, but their hearts are already being challenged. There is an interest in prayer and possibly even a need for prayer. But something vital is about to happen and it's going to bring about a change. Paul simply uh, will explain that to us in that little uh, term, whose hearts God had opened. Now let's read a little bit about that. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. What does that suggest? <laughs> That suggests that as he walks, Paul talks. You know, uh, one of the words that is used to describe the, the preaching of the word, there are uh, several words that are translated preached in the Bible. We have Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost where he preached to a crowd and it led to a form of appeal. And remember where the men all said to each other, what shall we do? Uh, and, and that led to, uh, to a decision-making process. Uh, Paul told them, of course, to repent. And so so that, that's one word. And then we're told that Jesus, by the Spirit, from the cross, went and preached to those who were in prison before the days of Noah. The word therefore preached is that of a, uh, the herald of a king who is given a proclamation and they simply go out and they proclaim exactly word for word what they have been told. That's another uh, form of the word. And then there's the other one where we read that after the persecution came upon the church in Jerusalem, they went everywhere preaching the gospel. And the word preaching there literally means gossiping. So wherever they went, they talked about the gospel. 
over the fence talking to the neighbor. They talked about the gospel. Sitting on the bus going into town, they talked the gospel. I'm using modern terms. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that Paul caught a bus. It doesn't mention that in the Bible. But here is the thought, the concept, that everywhere they went, they used the opportunity given to them to share the gospel. So here we are told in this uh, verse, Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyra Tyra. That was in Asia Minor. So, here is Lydia. And we read here, who worshipped God? The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. So the first convert here is, um, is Lydia. And... Uh, we read down in verse 15, when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. So she was a fairly, well, she was a businesswoman, and um, she knew how to tackle Paul. And so Paul and... Uh, Silas and Timothy, who were the accompanying uh, evangelists with him, they stayed a little while. The word household there is interesting. It doesn't just mean family, but it also refers to anyone connected to the family. For example, if you have a family business, and in that family business you employ a dozen people to work for you, and with you, they automatically come in under this umbrella of household. So it's not just the immediate family, but also the extended family. And uh, just to, um, to, to pick up on, on this in verse 15, when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. Judge me to be faithful to the Lord. Not to your preaching, not to your influence, but faithful to the Lord. You see, that's the genuine mark of true conversion. It's not doing what peers are doing. It's not following the crowd. It's not just being emotionally involved in some process. It is being faithful to the Lord. So here is what has happened. Paul receives a call from Macedonia. Paul is faithful to the Lord. He goes into Philippi. He shares the gospel. He is faithful to the Lord. Lydia hears the gospel. Her heart is opened, and she submits or surrenders her heart to the Lord. She is faithful to the Lord. See, the Lord's work is all about the Lord. It's not ours. We are privileged to be a part of it, to be involved in it, but ultimately souls are only converted when God works at opening their heart. And when he plants the seed and the seed is nurtured and grows, then uh, that work is genuine. Now, our time has gone in, but I do want to just conclude by uh, looking uh, a little bit further down this chapter with you. Uh, look at verse um, 16. Now it happened as we went to prayer. 
So what Lydia had been doing at the riverside, they are continuing to do. And a certain slave girl, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, and I'm, I'm always interested in this comment, greatly annoyed. I wonder what that means. Would you like to see Paul when he was greatly annoyed? Read through First and Second Corinthians and you get a little bit of a picture of Paul when he's annoyed. But here he is. He turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. See, even though Paul was annoyed, God still used him as an instrument. And Paul confesses that, uh, uh, I think we quoted this in the prayer, where Paul said, the things I knew I should do, I didn't do. The things I knew I shouldn't do, I did. But still, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, how often have we said that to ourselves? Oh, you shouldn't have got annoyed about that. Oh, you shouldn't have been upset about that. But we do get annoyed. We do get upset. And, and sometimes that's the motivation that drives us to make comment or, or to, to, to pass some remark. But here is the, is the bottom line. Paul was totally sold out to the will of God. And wherever God took him, Paul went. And wherever Paul went, God used him. And that ought to be the, the, the motivation of uh, our hearts and lives. So this second convert was a slave. She was a soothsayer, a spirit medium, a fortune teller, a tarot card reader. Didn't have them in those days. All of those things, and yet she was dominated on the outside by ruthless masters. She was a slave, and she was dominated on the inside by demonic spirits. And so she responds to Paul's teaching and preaching and identifies with him as a true messenger of the gospel. Uh, the third convert, and this is the, the final one, the third convert is, as you know, the Philippian jailer. And uh, this was the first male uh, convert. Uh, he wasn't in the class of um, Lydia, nor was he in the same uh, class as the slave girl. He was somewhere in the middle. So we've got the upper class, <coughs> we've got the um, lower class, and the middle class. And here is the uniqueness of the gospel. It touches every class. It doesn't matter where we stand and on the social ladder. The gospel meets a need in all our hearts. Now, this uh, Philippian jailer, being a part of the Roman Empire, would be, quite naturally, a Caesar worshipper. So he has some kind of concept about deity, but Caesar has never been able to do what's about to happen uh, in the form of the earthquake. Uh, Caesar could make the knees quake, but he couldn't make the earth quake. That's what God does. And uh, so again, you're all familiar with the account of the Philippian jailer. And uh, in verse 33, all of his household 
were baptized. So there again we have uh, that extended family. So this now becomes the nucleus of the church at Philippi, an Asian woman who had been a proselyte to Judaism, successful in the business world. God opens her heart and she receives the gift of salvation. Second, a slave girl who had been demon possessed. Again, God opened her heart, chased away the demons and uh, planted her in this uh, church in Philippi. And then the third was a Roman jailer and of course the household as well. Now let's just finish off by going back where we started. Verse 1 of Philippians chapter 1. Just look at that first verse. Paul and Timothy, born servants of Jesus Christ. Now note this. Here we have Lydia. We have the slave girl. And we have the Philippian jailer. And others who now have believed and been brought into the church. And notice how Paul addresses them. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. So here they are in the midst of this foolish and perverse generation. And yet God has raised them up and they are saints. That's the grace of God. That's the glory of God. And so Paul will, uh, will bring uh, this all out as we go through the, uh, the little epistle. You will notice if you have your study notes there that right at the bottom I've simply put down the fact that several years have passed, much has happened in the meantime, and now Paul writes this little epistle to them. And you will note that Paul will never forget those early days. Look what he tells us in verse 3 to 6 of chapter 1, I have you in my mind. Verse 7 to 8, I have you in my heart. And verse 9 to 11, I have you in my heart prayers. Amen. As we go through the book of Philippians, I have no doubt that God will teach us many practical lessons that we will do well to embrace as we, no doubt, can identify the times in which we live as being foolish and perverse. Let's bow for prayer. Loving Father, we continue to rejoice in the many blessings you bestow upon us, graciously and bountifully. The blessing of God is shaken together, pressed down and always running over. You have confirmed that if we bring all the tithes into the storehouse and prove you now, herewith saith the Lord, I will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. There shall not be room enough to receive it. We long for the showers of blessing in this dry and parched land. We plead your mercy and your grace. Help us to live as saints of God in the midst of a foolish and perverse generation. We pray in our Saviour's name. Amen.